In this video, I'm going to be doing a teardown of a Sony VAIO C1 picture book. I'll be upgrading the internal storage with a compact flash based SSD solution. I'll replace a damaged power jack, install some replacement 3D printed feet, show my solution to get it working with a non functional battery installed, and then finally take a quick tour of Windows. A brief history the VAIO C1 picture book series are sub notebooks that first came out in 1998. There were four generations. Mine here is a first generation C1S, which is the Japanese equivalent of the C1X, released in the US. It has a 266 megahertz Pentium MMX processor, 64 megabytes of RAM built in, upgradable to 128 with a proprietary module, an extra wide 1024 by 480 8.9 inch screen, it came with a 4.3 gigabyte standard 2.5 inch 44 pin ID hard drive, it came with Windows 98 installed, and weighed just 2.2 pounds. So now let's take a look around the C1. Along the back, we just have our 16 volt power jack. On the side, we have our PC card slot, and then a little flip out dial up modem. Along the front, our screen latch release button and then our power programmable key button. On the opposite side, we have an infrared port, headphone and microphone jack, USB, firewire, our power switch, and then underneath this little door, a proprietary video out port. Inside, we have our mouse buttons, track point. Up top, we have our 640 by 480 webcam, you can flip it around to face the other side, and then it's got a little manual focus dial on top. We have a hardware capture button that brings up the little camera app. So now let's start the teardown, beginning by removing the battery. Checking under the memory cover, which you kind of have to release by poking through a little hole and sliding the cover aside. Next up, we have seven screws to remove. This one in the middle here had a factory sticker on it that I peeled off. That's what's going into the bottom of the keyboard. Next up, we need to lift up the keyboard. This is pretty simple. There's two little clips holding it on down by the control keys on either side. Just kind of pry it to the side a little bit. It'll lift up. Be careful for the ribbon cable. The little clips holding down the two ribbon cables just kind of slide up to release the tension.
We have one small screw in the upper right corner. Next up, I'm releasing all the little clips holding the top cover on, although I probably should have removed the rest of the ribbon cables first. And now to remove the remaining ribbon cables, I believe this is the webcam. It also just slides up to release. Next, the two display cables. There's a little metal arm that you can lift up. These are in pretty tight. It needs a bit of force to lift them. You definitely don't want to grab them by those fine little wires. And you can see I'm struggling a little bit because I missed the ribbon cable down at the bottom connecting the trackpad and speaker to the motherboard. You also probably notice it's kind of discolored the metal right above the CMOS battery right there. I'm a little bit into the heat sink. Next up, I'm getting ready to remove the motherboard. First, I'm removing the little modem connector from the right. And then the power jack on the left, which I'm going to be replacing later.
So to get this up, I'm basically lifting it up by the PC card slot. Try to get an angle to slide the ports out of the case. Being careful on the fine little power switch to make sure you don't break something. And now taking a look at how to remove the hard drive. Mine is non-functional. On the back, there's four screws labeled H going into the drive. And now the hard drive's out of the way, and get better access to the CMOS battery connector. I'm definitely going to remove this battery. I'm a little worried it's done damage, because you saw that discoloration above on the metal plate. I don't really feel any moisture. You can also see a little bit of discoloration on the CPU heatsink. It's a little tricky to get this connector out. It's super fine wires and a really tiny connector. I had to wiggle it back and forth a lot. But in the end, I don't actually see any signs of leakage onto the board doing damage or even corrosion going on the wires. My guess is the batteries are leaking, but it's still all contained within the heat shrink. It's kind of outgassing, and that's what's just going into metal above and to the side of it. Now getting the battery out was a little tricky because it's got double-sided tape and it's stuck down to the top of some chips. I considered maybe using a heat gun or a razor blade to kind of cut it away. But in the end, I just kind of used my plastic spudger to get it started, brute strength it off.
So now we're ready to install our compact flash solution using a four gigabyte Transcend industrial compact flash card, a simple 44 pin IDE compact flash adapter, trimming off the extra long jumper pins on the bottom. Decide to throw some double-sided tape onto the back of the adapter. Not so much to stick it down, I'm leaving the paper on the back, but more just as a spacer. The nice thing about this first generation C1 at least, if you ever want to pull the compact flash card to re-image or to copy on a bunch of files, all you need to do is remove the single screw holding in the keyboard. You can flip it up, and then you have full access to the card. You don't even need to disconnect any ribbon cables. There's a final inspection, double checking to see if there's any battery damage, but it all looks pretty good here, even the pins. Now my C1 came with a bad power jack. You had to have it plugged in at just the right angle for it to work. A lot of times it would just fall right out of the jack. Luckily there's someone on eBay selling a replacement jack for this model. And here's that replacement jack. It's a little bit unusual because it almost looked like this just plugs into a connector on the board. But instead there's these little spring load clips that poke through the board and are soldered in. Fortunately to be able to desolder that, you're gonna have to pull off this metal shield on the bottom held on with a bunch of screws. If you're not replacing your power jack, you can skip all this. There's nothing else underneath to do. So we have six screws along the bottom, numbered one to six, and then three brass screws, A, B, and C, to remove. So after a cut to desolder those two pins, they're still being held in by those spring-loaded clips. So it takes a little bit of wiggling, 
back and forth to get it to pop out. It's just a matter of pushing in the new connector through the holes. Again, there's a bit of tension here for those spring-loaded pins. And after another cut, I've now soldered in those pins. We should be all good. Then out of curiosity, taking a quick peek under the heatsink, the chipset, and the CPU. And now to put that shield back on. And now to stick the motherboard back into the base. We're going to angle it in, making sure that the switch mates up with the case.
Now we can put the top cover back on. And since I replaced my power jack, I need to tuck in this little plastic trim piece holding back the wires so it doesn't interfere with the screw hole. And then we just clip everything back together, making sure that the power jack and the modem port line up between the two halves. Kind of got hung up a bit here on the right side. I realized it was catching on the PC card eject lever. Just had to kind of move it around a little bit and then it would drop down. And then we install the screw in the upper right. We install six screws into the bottom, leaving out the one in the top center that screws into the bottom of the keyboard underneath the sticker. Next, we install the four ribbon cables. We have the two display cables here, then the webcam and the mouse buttons. Now on a side, you'll notice when I'm doing the mouse buttons at the bottom, I'm gonna struggle a bit. It's kind of hard to get it to stay tight. And then later when I do the first test, I notice that the mouse buttons don't work or the speakers, which are all on a little daughter board connected by that little ribbon cable. So I end up taking it back apart. And as I'm inspecting it, I realize that the ribbon cable is missing the little blue translucent piece of plastic at the end of the ribbon cable. This is used to reinforce it, but it also thickens it up so that the little connector can grab it more securely. That's why mine was so loose. I actually remember seeing the little square when I was cleaning up afterwards, not realizing what it was. And also taking it apart, the little blue strip also fell off the webcam ribbon cable. So I think the glue was getting kind of weak, so it's something to watch out for. I could have tried to glue the little plastic piece back on 
but instead I decided just to use some Kapton tape, about three layers worth. You can see the little blue strip there on the webcam cable. And that was enough that the connector now clamped down securely on the ribbon cable, and I got my mouse buttons and speakers back. Here's that problem cable. You can see it's lost its little reinforcement piece. So finally, we reinstall the keyboard, starting with the two ribbon cables, and then it'll just push into place. And again, you can see how easy it's gonna to be to access our compact flashcard later, just by lifting the keyboard away. Now a quick note, if you have a dead battery that won't take a charge, which you most likely probably do, when I had the battery connected, it wouldn't let me turn on the laptop. Now you could use it without the battery plugged in, but that doesn't look nice, although they do make a 3D printed dummy battery cover. First I tried using some Kapton tape to cover the two pins on either side, which are usually the positive and negative. That didn't seem to work. Maybe I just didn't fully cover the pins. So instead I just took a longer, oversized piece kind of pushed it in between each pin on the laptop connector, shoved it in, and now I could turn on the laptop. Another problem I wanted to solve is the rubber feet along the front. It gotten all hard and were kind of flaking off, and the rubber feet at the top were mostly already gone. So first I scraped off the old feet using a plastic spudger, some Goo Gone, and some Windex. I didn't want to risk alcohol in case it damaged the paint. I found a 3D model on Thingiverse, for replacement feet that you print in TPU, which is kind of an elastic filament. I've never really used it before. It's a little stringy. I used some gel super glue to reattach them. I think it came out pretty good. So as we do our first boot, take a look at BIOS and then Windows 98. A couple notes on installing the operating system. There are recovery CDs for the C1X, the US version, and the C1S, the Japanese version I have here. On archive.org. While it did install, when I rebooted, it would just hang on a blinking cursor. Checking the drive, I did see that it installed Windows and all the applications. Tried a couple of recovery tools, but didn't really get far. So I tried the C1X software for English models. It does do a model check, and the first check was easy to bypass because you just comment out a line in a batch file. However, all the files are stored in a .pac file, which seems to be a proprietary Sony compressed file, and the unpack tool also seems to have a model check. I tried swapping a few things around, like taking the unpack tool from my C1S, replacing the one on the C1X media. That didn't seem to work. Maybe it's a slightly different file version. I tried the reverse, taking the pack file from the US version, replacing the file in the Japanese version. But again, it didn't seem to like the file, so maybe a mismatch. So in the end, I just did a clean install of standard Windows 98, then used the application recovery CD from the US version. And although the installation wizard 
blocked me from installing since it saw the model mismatch, I was able to just open up each individual folder directly and run the installers from there. So let's take a look at Windows 98. I thought this was kind of interesting that you could control everything in the BIOS from this Windows application. You can't see it here, but I'm pressing the programmable power key on the front edge of the laptop, which is set to open Internet Explorer currently. We can configure what applications the program will open. You can open it on a timer. You can also use combinations with Alt and Control and Shift. So you can actually get four functions out of that front button. I thought this battery scope application was kind of cool, especially considering this is a Windows 98 application. It shows the manufacture date, the number of cycles on the wear level. You can see I'm at 100% wear level. And even though I plugged this in and it seemed to be charging over the course of a couple hours, climbing from zero to 100%, as soon as you pull the power plug, the laptop would immediately power down. So it wasn't holding any charge. Here's the webcam software, which you can also access from a hardware button. That's it. Thanks for watching.